uh, I just want to introduce our uh, guest speakers today. Um, Nancy and I and our counterparts, my name is Stephanie Merrill, um, Nancy Gaucher, Andrew Spring, and Stephanie Morningstar. We make up the knowledge mobilization team for Global Water Futures. Uh, and it's often the four of us doing the webinars, doing the uh, explanations of what knowledge mobilization is and harassing everybody about doing it better. Uh, so we thought uh, we'd change it up a little bit and bring some guests to uh, add some diversity of voices to that conversation. Um, so we've got Katja McDonald and Jelena Leader, and they are research facilitators here at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, they work with researchers in their respective departments. Um, Katja is with the, the library, and Jelena is with the business school, Edwards Business School. Uh, and they work with their respective researchers on helping them develop good research uh, proposals. And they specifically uh, specialize in the knowledge mobilization aspects of those research proposals. So they've got colleagues across campus who do a similar thing for all faculties here. Um, and I suspect other universities have similar roles and people playing similar roles. So I'm going to hand it off to them. They're going to go through a slide deck and use the shirt, the Social Sciences and Humanities Framework for defining and um, creating a knowledge mobilization plan. But as I said before, it's not the only framework. There are many, many. Um, uh, but we thought that using the SHRC, uh, they're, they're the Tri Council agency that kind of has done the most work on defining knowledge mobilization and crafting a framework for researchers to follow. So we thought, uh, why not shoot for the gold standard and, and use the highest bar necessary uh, to create uh, and understand how to pull together the effective components of a knowledge mobilization plan. And whether or not it's a SHRC proposal that you're writing, if you're following some of these elements, you're sure to be creating uh, one of the best knowledge mobilization plans that you can. So I'm going to pass off to these ladies. Thank you so much for coming today. Well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, you've already spoke to SHRC and why we're kind of talking about that, being that in our colleges we work primarily with social sciences and uh, humanities researchers. Uh, but today we're going to talk a little bit about you know, defining and evaluating the knowledge mobilization plan. Some of the key considera considerations for building that knowledge mobilization plan, um, using some tips and tricks and examples from successful applications, we found is sort of one of the best ways to build and break down uh, your own proposals in whatever capacity your funding agency might be adapting it to. Um, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So I'm going to jump in here with sort of a broad overview definition. And this definition is pulled from a few different places, but is uh, very much tied to what SHRC uses as criteria for uh, discussing and defining knowledge mobilization and for evaluating what knowledge mobilization looks like within grant proposals and within research in general. Um, and so some of this will be familiar with you, but this is sort of to set a basis for sort of how we're going to proceed with our discussion here. Um, and basically, it's a large scale term that talks about um, basically getting your research out there in a way that is usable, that creates change, um, that influences decision making. Um, and so that can be within academia, um, but significantly it really needs to be beyond academia as well. And that can be um, with industry, with government partners, with community organizations, with indigenous communities, um, with other communities that you might be working with, um, a really broad range. But essentially it's thinking about who will use this knowledge that you're creating and what will that knowledge do to influence change or influence decision making for those people? Um, how will they implement it into their own into their own activities that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and it's also key that um, knowledge mobilization includes ways to share your data as well as the finished product. Um, so it's very much, and we're going to be coming back to this idea along the way, but the idea that uh, as much of the research process as possible is collaborative and is engaging with people who are going to be using the knowledge. So Shirk's specific definition um, speaks to some of those same points that essentially it's going to benefit the users of the knowledge. 
uh, whoever you identify that to be, and inevitably it will be people both within academia and beyond academia, uh, and create uh, positive impacts or positive change based on that knowledge. And so uh, it's essentially being very clear and explicit about the knowledge you're creating and what it is able to do for people who are actually going to be engaging with it once it leaves your hands, essentially. Um, and Shirk is very clear, obviously, about um, the positive impact, which I think is everyone's goal for their research, but it's sort of the next step of making sure that that research is accessible in a way that those positive impacts are, are possible and usable. So as, as, as some examples of what knowledge mobilization, both within and beyond academia, can look like. Um, within academia, it may be more, it may be informing some of the research process. It might be in, informing methodologies. Um, it might be informing future research projects. It might be informing sort of how others undertake their research. Uh, beyond academia, your research may help to inform policy or practice discussions. Um, it might directly have an impact on what kinds of services are available or how those services are offered, um, potentially identifying new services that might be useful or necessary. Um, and essentially informs the way that people make their decisions about whichever aspect of their lives your research is going to be affecting and where they're going to be using your research. Great. And so uh, kind of jumping into what that plan might look like, uh, this is actually a tool that uh, is adapted from the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. And so I, I really like this uh, tool because it, it breaks it down, um, the different considerations they have for building your knowledge mobilization plan. It asks you, the, asks you those key questions of what, why, who, how, and when. Uh, and each of these questions really help you break down those parts of the knowledge <laughs> That's neat. Uh, uh, in order to be able to build a quality uh, plan as well. So um, in addition to that, there's a measuring piece. Uh, it might be cut off a little bit on our screen there, but um, it's essentially looking at how you're going to evaluate uh, the success of your knowledge mobilization strategy, and that being you know, measurable with indicators, both quantitative or qualitative. That could be as simple as um, asking your key stakeholders or partners, you know, whether we need right, whether we need wrong, let's say we need wrong, but uh, what, what are ways to improve it, um, and then finding key indicators. Yeah, can I explore it for Oh, yes, okay. for sure. Okay. Yeah, this, this is my tool, but I can yeah. easily find it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I ended up recreating it for the plug because it didn't really show up quite well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I really like this model. Um, essentially, it's when you're asking yourself uh, questions around what knowledge are you trying to mobilize and how is that connected to your, your goals and your intended outcomes? What are the key messages? Or also, conversely, your stakeholder or partner's uh, messages as well to connect together. Uh, the why is so important because you're, you're understanding why you're building this knowledge and, and then being able to understand how that will be utilized. And importantly, the next one being who. So that's identifying who are the users of the knowledge. Who are your partners and champions that will then take this knowledge and mobilize it in an effective way, uh, translating that for, for say, practitioners' uses. It could be in you know, indigenous community context. Uh, it's really identifying who are those people that are moving that knowledge. And, um, connected to that is how will you collaborate with them. So when you're building a proposal, and we'll, when we jump into the examples, we're going to talk quite a bit about the technical pieces of how do you write you know, these into your uh, plan as well and into your proposal. It's, it's really showing what are those uh, mutual benefits that are then going to be for both the researcher or the team as well as their collaborators. And so again, the process of going through these questions is really helping you build out and identifying. And actually, we, we have passed out physical copies of um, a plan that we'll talk about a little bit later, but that can maybe be emailed to those that are connecting with us on uh, WebEx as well. Um, but it basically helps you break down um, and it follows some of these questions as well. Um, the when is actually a really important piece that often gets missed. So that's when you're looking at timelines. Uh, so when are these activities taking place? Um, and how will you implement them throughout that timeline? So 
one of the pieces with that is that oftentimes you have stakeholders, maybe it's within municipalities, with ministries, it could be First Nations communities, they all have different priorities and different activities going on in their own lives and then their own realms or world. Uh, and you have to be mindful of that. And part of that process is maybe consulting early on to find out when is the best time to say engage in the communities or um, build in your knowledge mobilization pieces because you really want the uptake to be at the full capacity. So you don't want to plan a project meeting or an event when there's something else happening in a community. And as I mentioned before, there's measurable ways to um, address or and assess whether your strategy is, is working well. And so again, we, we use the language of sure. Uh, but applicable to a variety of uh, application processes. Um, it really can be, like proposal development itself can be uh, tricky with any funding agency. Uh, with this one, they use weighted scores, um, and that's kind of a common practice. So one of them is uh, revolving around this idea of challenge, um, and that really looks at how, you know, what is significant about your project, what are the original components or novel pieces of research, and how KM fits into that is really how well your plan um, is able to be implemented that impacts beyond. Again, as Katja had mentioned before, looking at both the impacts within and beyond uh, academia. And so it's looking at how reasonable and appropriate those methods of KM are. Uh, and oftentimes there's the scores associated with this. So when you're building up your, your own proposal that maybe doesn't use these terminologies of challenge, um, it could just be looking at how you're mobilizing that knowledge. Um, similarly, feasibility. Essentially, this is a lot of context here. It's the quality and appropriateness of your knowledge mobilization plan. But it's really looking at, can you do this, uh, this knowledge mobilization plan? How is it built into your project that is feasible? Is your, again, going back to timelines, are you proposing to do something that can't be feasible within that timeline? Uh, and it's, again, the appropriateness of those activities. The third one is capability, uh, and this is really about looking at past experiences of the researchers or the team. Uh, oftentimes that goes back to someone's CV and looking at what has been done in the past, has there been um, ex experience in using knowledge mobilization activities, has there been outreach with the communities, for instance. And so uh, in connection with that, it's really looking at whether you, you have a team that can uh, facilitate knowledge mobilization. If not, it makes it even more important to outline how you're going to do that or drawing on those past experiences and best practices. And so, for instance, if you're going to propose to collaborate with the First Nation community and have never collaborated before with the communities you're proposing to work with, uh, you have to build that relationship building within the time frame that you're proposing. In essence, that relationship can't be built overnight, um, and so it has to be reasonable, feasible, and capable <laughs> in terms of your team. So that's sort of that piece there. So to sort of to sort of build on that, that that's what uh, what SHRC and a lot of other funding agencies may be using different languages, but essentially are going to be looking at those big three components of um, of what makes sense for a knowledge mobilization plan and can you do it? Is it a good fit? Um, but what that means in practice for you and your individual research is going to vary a lot depending on your role in the project, depending on the goals of the research, um, and depending on uh, depending on your relationship with the knowledge users and the potential knowledge users that you have. Um, and so, uh, to to sort of sort through these ideas again, it's, it uh, really makes a lot of sense to start early in the knowledge mobilization plan. It's not something that happens at the end of a project or as something that sort of ties it ties the project up, but it's meant to be um, a collaboration throughout the process. And so, um, depending on all of these different factors of who the knowledge users are, um, what your research essentially looks like, um, and how the research needs to fit not only within um, the community or knowledge users' expectations, but also within uh, your own research community, um, and then building on experiences that you may have had already, it's going to look very different depending on um, who those knowledge users are and how you need to engage with them. And to determine that, it really is, again, uh, a conversation with potential knowledge users about what's going to work best for them and 
building that dialogue so that you can work together to develop something that meets both of your goals, um, in, uh, both on the research side and on the knowledge mobilization side. So thinking about who's going to use the results of the research um, and what are they going to need from you in the same way? What do you need to hear from them to effectively um, undertake the research and get the research out there in a way that has those positive mutual benefits? So we're going to be jumping into um, a few examples now to sort of give some, <coughs> some more concrete, I guess, weight to, to some of these sort of big picture best practices that we've been talking about. And so uh, these are from recent grant applications, all various SHRC applications that um, the principal investigators have uploaded to the U of S um, grant repository. So uh, they have permission for these to be uh, for these to be shared and discussed more broadly um, and basically their goal in uploading them was to assist others in developing successful grant applications. And so we, uh, we're looking at a few different examples, um, all from various projects with different focus, uh, different knowledge mobilization plans, and so we're going to be looking at um, what they've obviously done successfully, and these are all successful grant proposals, so we know that they were successful, but beyond that, uh, where are there still questions? What could they improve on? Uh, what are other considerations that they maybe didn't make? So uh, this was um, an Indigenous Studies proposal. Um, the principal investigator was very much in hoping to influence policy with the research. Um, and so uh, it's sort of, you can see the color-coded areas there. Um, one of its first sentences that um, is outlining the values that the researcher has uh, for his research, uh, what is motivating him to undertake this plan, and how his plan um, justifies the approach that he's taking and vice versa. Um, and then he's very specific about what that's going to look like within the plan. So he's not just saying, this is what I want to do and this is why I want to do it, but he's also saying, um, this is very specific how I'm going to do it. And it's going to work because I've laid out these logical three steps. So on a very practical level, um, he's also being very clear in his writing, uh, making things stand out to the reviewer of the grant application um, using numbered headings uh, and also being very specific about how the knowledge mobilization fits into the grant as a whole. So uh, that's the other really significant part of knowledge mobilization is that it's not a standalone kind of effort and it's not, um, as I mentioned, something that happens at the end, but it's built into all of the research phases. And so a successful grant application will make that clear within the grant proposal uh, by saying how this connects to the various um, parts of the grant that are going to be happening throughout. So he reiterates those goals, um, bearing in mind that reviewers are typically very busy, um, typically are reading you know, a great big stack of applications. This is uh, a way to make it clear and make it obvious that this person has thought through the knowledge mobilization piece and is connecting it um, to very specific activities, both within his own research and beyond. Um, so he's um, here he's also talking about the academic knowledge mobilization piece by identifying potential journals to publish in and also looking at ways to fill gaps in the existing, uh, the existing academic knowledge. So he's, he's looking at both public and academic engagement here. again, is very specific about what the knowledge mobilization looks like. He's uh, identified three specific activities that he's going to be undertaking, and he's numbered those so that it's clear to reviewers that that's happening. Um, and so that's, that clarity and specificity is really quite key because it indicates to the reviewers of the grant application that you have a plan and that the plan makes sense within the larger context of your research. It's beyond sort of having good intentions you have a structure for the steps that you're going to take. 
um, and also justifies and explains why these specific uh, why these specific audiences and specific knowledge users are the ones he wants to target. Why the why are these the ones that make sense for his research? And then there is another example, uh, another investigator, John Bass, uh, working more in the art field, so humanities, uh, is working on a post-digital book arts project. Um, what I really like about this structure here is that he provides a timeline or sense of timing for each activity. So he kind of pulls that out, he's highlighted that in green uh, in the first year, and then by the end of the first year, like sort of when are these activities going to happen? Uh, he also identifies specific knowledge users, in this case, not necessarily working directly with them, but in the context of what is this or who is this information is important for and how are they going to use it. So it reiterates in this case uh, identifying Canadian craft bookmakers. Uh, they also mention around creating a project website where a lot of this can be housed um, information that then the public can also access or anyone interested in book arts. So this is a neat way of doing that. Also selecting uh, communication mediums to suit each of the audiences. So uh, at the bottom there, there's another blue a line that says um, around trade journals such as Book Arts Canada. So just a variety of different mediums that the information is being shared back in with the key pieces there. Um, again, here, um, if you kind of go down to the, the last part of that paragraph, we talked about two different conferences, one that's more practitioner-based and one that would be within the humanities and computer science, so that being your academic audience, um, and also identifying um, in connection to the research being of international scope, that they're also being mindful of what kind of knowledge mobilization activities reaching out to the conferences or journals of the interdisciplinary and international level scope. <laughs> so, kind of bringing everything together in that way, um, you'll see in the green, um, these are very specific to, and we say, oh, wait, but standing for open access, that these specific plans for making the data or the research available to open access, not you know, hidden behind at paywall structures. So for instance, uh, if you don't have access to a journal at university, you have to then purchase it kind of thing. Um, with this, he's uh, talked about having a, not only public talks in a library, which is publicly, public gallery, which uh, people could access, uh, also talked about how archiving, sort of in that last paragraph, uh, finally all the research output and, uh, of the project, including the code developed, are archived and made publicly available on the website. So again, really just articulating what it is and how they're going to be doing it, um, justifying why this is important for all for the plan. So this uh, third example is from a, a library researcher um, working on a, basically a national project in scope, uh, looking at um, looking at local music collections. And so that's the context for this one. Um, and as you'll see, it's going to inform some of the knowledge mobilization activities that, they, um, that they've identified. Um, so again, being very clear and specific about the goal of the knowledge mobilization plan, um, what, what they want as the outcome of the research to be, or what, they're, what they want and expect the outcome of the research to be for knowledge users not only for their own work, but for knowledge users as well. Um, and they're very uh, very focused on creating dot dialogue and creating knowledge exchange. And so um, that fits very nicely within these knowledge mobilization best practices as a practice that um, keeps in close contact with knowledge users and potential knowledge users to, uh, to understand what they're going to need from your research in order to be able to implement it um, and to gain benefit from it. And so this is a plan that identifies that very specifically. Um, again, they've specifically identified the audiences that they want to reach. Um, it's beyond, we want to get our research out there, and it's beyond saying, we hope a large number of people will access the research, but they're identifying who these people will, are likely to be and what they're going to be able to take away from it. And again, they're providing those time frames, a timeline for those activities so that um, they have benchmarks throughout the project, and that's a, so that they can also go back to knowledge users and and say, this is where we're at, here's where we are, this is what we're hoping to do in the next year. Um, does that work with you, and does that make sense for what your goals are from this research? Uh, 
Uh, so again, they're, um, they're being very clear about how this knowledge mobilization piece fits into the rest of the project. Uh, they're looking at the publications that they expect to arise from it, um, but also making that data open access again. And so that may be the piece where a broader audience um, beyond academics are going to be accessing this. Um, so looking at these specific timelines, specific dates even, so that they have a benchmark not only for themselves, but also for the people who are going to be using this knowledge at the end. Um, one thing that's significant here that, that isn't addressed, that I think could be addressed, is that um, at, you notice at the bottom, they're planning to launch the online geovisualization tool, and that's the part that they expect uh, will be accessible to the public, that anyone interested in these local music collections will be able to access. Um, the question, though, is how is the public going to find out about this? How are they going to know about it? Um, so the piece of making things accessible, but then also um, continuing that dialogue with knowledge users so that they're going to be able to access these tools in a way that's easy and effective. Um, not simply that they're there, but that people know they're there and know how to access them. Oh, okay. yeah, you've already talked. Yeah, sort of talked about that. Jump again. So, knowledge mobilization, as we've said repeatedly, is an ongoing and two way process. I feel like we're kind of repeating ourselves, but it's, it's really the, the meat bones of what knowledge mobilization is. It, it's you're, you're using community or partner or stakeholder expertise to also draw in and understand how, um, you know, how you're, how you're going to be able to utilize the knowledge in both practice and theory, I guess, when it comes to academics. Um, again, that two-way process is built into all stages of the research. It is also based on building those relationships, as I mentioned earlier, um, having that consultation, you know, co-developing your proposal with your, with your community or your society, using various terms, but basically the person or the group that you're working with that can mobilize the knowledge, again, for mutual benefit. Uh, and as Katja mentioned very clearly in, in the applications, they talk about the timelines. Those check-in points are so uh, key for being able to build in, say, a meeting um, or these different milestones that you'll have uh, to assess whether you're doing well, what can happen next. And so what does that look like in practice? Again, starting early with the relationship building process, as uh, I mentioned, sort of that um, consultation piece where you can then talk about some of those mutual benefits, but also the expectations and managing some of those. Um, what, you know, in terms of what this research will promise, sometimes that can be, um, there, there may be a fuzzy line in there, and there may be uh, the stakeholders assuming something is going to be promised that isn't. So, in being really clear, sometimes that's even outlined in a research agreement or an MOU, whatever that can look understanding um, at the same time being flexible and also recognizing that all research doesn't always go to plan or is expected to have a contingency plan and that could be articulated in a proposal as well say if you're working with a brand new partner and you're kind of in the first stages of looking you're consulting and you're building a proposal together but um, ensuring that there's room for uh, flexibility and being able to change it up as needed and being able to articulate why uh, it's important to engage these communities or partners, and then what would happen if it doesn't go to plan. So how, do, how would you fulfill the research need if it doesn't go the way you plan? <laughs> and one of the, this is actually the fourth example, um, and this one focuses a little bit more on um, collaboration. So it's kind of, how does that maybe look? Um, one of the questions we have is, well, what about uh, the relationship building? So in this case, they have articulated that the partners, um, their partners' goals for collaborating are around energy extraction and it's associated with consultation and approval processes. Those were of key political interest for them. I talked a little bit about the context there, but again, how is that articulated? Like one step further would be then we were going to work together to build research agreement or MLU uh, and talk talk a little bit about that in the actual proposal may be beneficial there too. So that's kind of what's missing there. Um, and then at the same time in the green here, um, acknowledging partners and knowledge and experience in contributing to the work. So the communities are as your experts kind of approach uh, that it's that two-way dialogue. Um, your research experts, but there's also community experts in those ways too. And so 
again, being explicit about what uh, you're going to get from the knowledge exchange, that there's a mutual benefit connected to it. Um, here, he talks about a clear plan for creating those opportunities for dialogue and feedback, uh, agreeing upon expectations, for instance. So they're talking about having these meetings at different frequencies. Uh, this is also where the expectations, as I mentioned before, can be built in. So this is kind of a good example of where they talk about um, when they're in doing you know, check-ins and meetings. Uh, partners, again, have input into the research direction. So this, uh, in the purple here, they're talking about uh, how the partner representatives will be on steering committees. So like building in those mechanisms that they're able to give direct feedback, but not only that direction and decision making in the research process. One of the questions we have is how will the research team then incorporate this? What if it opposes exactly what they're trying to do, but uh, um, say with the research uh, approach that they're going to take, but it actually needs to be done in a different way? How will they incorporate the feedback that they're getting? Say if the community says, actually, no, we don't want to research this question, it's a tangential related question that's more important to us. How do you then address that? So, Sort of zooming back out, uh, we've looked at those proposals and looked at some specific ways of, of what, uh, what successful knowledge mobilization plans and proposals have done well. Um, zooming back out, what can we sort of distill from that? Um, and I think um, you've already heard us say most of these things several times now, but um, identifying knowledge users and audiences. So not just people who are going to hear the research or hear about it, but people who are going to be the ones using it and implementing that knowledge to create some kind of change or decision making. Um, and so identifying, but also engaging with them directly so that you create that dialogue um, and you create that ongoing conversation that makes your research um, as usable um, and as useful as possible. Um, within the context of a grant application, very important to justify the approaches that you're taking, um, the tools and resources that you need to undertake those activities. Um, so again, that, uh, that comes back to the ongoing dialogue with knowledge users, um, being able to explain why the knowledge mobilization plan that you've made makes sense for these people and for your research in these ways. Um, building that knowledge mobilization piece into the entirety of your research and into the entirety of your grant proposal. So rather than having it be sort of a standalone piece, um, it connects to all of, all of the ways that you're doing your research from methodologies, your research design, um, it built into the budget, of course, um, built into your larger research goals. It's something that's, um, that's quite integrated throughout. Um, on a very practical level, when you're writing this up in a grant application, just making it readable, making the important parts stand out to someone who is reading a bajillion grant applications in you know, a very condensed span of time. Um, just those sort of practical pieces of how are you communicating this to the people who are ultimately going to give you funding to undertake it. And then including that sense of timing, which sort of connects to all of the other points as well. Um, the timing of how those knowledge mobilizations will occur and how does this fit within your overall plan for the research. Um, so again, knowing that you, you have a plan and that you have benchmarks that you, can, uh, that you can sort of keep to as you go along. Um, crucially, this is about, uh, about the use of knowledge, as I mentioned, not simply the consumption of knowledge or hearing knowledge, but taking that knowledge, um, understanding it, and using it in a way that is beneficial for the people who, who have engaged with it. Who's going to be interested in implementing this knowledge and what are their goals going to be essentially is the, the underlying question. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so we have the physical copies here, but also just to show uh, those who are connecting in on WebEx, uh, sort of a tool that can be used to then break out some of the strategy there. So a table that has asks, you know, who are those knowledge users? What is the strategy that you're going to take? So there's some questions aligned there. How will uh, you get your message across? Um, you know, scope of the output, budget for resources, timelines, and potential outcomes. So it really gives you a, a way to connect uh, you plan across the whole proposal essentially by then giving yourself a little template. Uh, so yeah, that's 
sort of what the purpose of this is. It's built off of other, there's lots of tools out there, um, built off of others that also identify these pieces, but uh, we could use it as sort of a worksheet. Uh, we've done workshops where we've had people fill it in, and obviously there's going to be, we put KU1, KU2, and on the back side of this, there's additional knowledge. It's just because we have to recognize that there may be, you know, not just one, but many uh, knowledge as well. So, that piece. And then some questions, if there are any, some maybe even ideas uh, to share or creative activities uh, and strategies. And maybe before we get into discussion, do you want to flip one more slide? I <laughs> took the liberty of adding a little content to myself. <laughs> um, just um, maybe they're on. There we go. So I just wanted to add one slide to just show that. You know, the ladies went through the SHRC framework. Um, the Global Water Futures Program is under the umbrella of the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. Um, and they also have some of their own uh, definitions and ways of reporting on knowledge mobilization. So I just wanted to throw this into the mix um, as a way of also, it's always just best practice to look back to the, you know, the specific funding agency or uh, guidelines that are provided per funding uh, agency, uh, and using some of the key language, the maybe the the buzzwords or the the framing that they are using to define and uh, review proposals, so that you're matching up the language and that you you can show that you have a common understanding with that funding agency and those reviewers on what knowledge mobilization concepts are and types of activities and their outputs and outcomes. Um, so I just uh, clipped this from the CPREP annual reporting template that is just available online. I think this was actually last year's um, template. Uh, so CFRF specifically talks about knowledge mobilization as uh, basically partnerships and collaborations with the private sector and international research institutions, the public sector, other academic and philanthropic organizations, which would be nonprofit, community-based organizations, uh, both in Canada and internationally. Um, and so when we get down to how to define what our, how our activities kind of jive with that definition, CFREP is looking for kind of this spectrum of engagement from beginning to end. And, and it's really aligned with the GWF KM team's definition of knowledge mobilization that we're using to increase our collective capacity to do this well. We're talking about really making sure that these uh, partnerships, collaborations, and engagements with our users are really uh, embedded in the planning of the research. So that's the proposal um, thinking and ideas and brainstorming process and putting that together into your actual you know, research plan. Uh, then they continue to be involved in the design and the data collection and the methodology, but the, the research component of the, of the work. Um, the an analysis of the results, they might uh, need to uh, add or give feedback on interpretations of what results mean for their community or their industry or whatever, um, that they are continuing to exchange throughout the life of the process um, and involved in the dissemination of, this, dissemination of this research knowledge. So oftentimes our partners are reflective of a larger group that they kind of represent, not formally represent, but, you know, an NGO can be what we call a boundary organization to other NGOs that kind of operate like them, do similar types of work, and they can help us provide advice on how uh, results and information can be packaged so that it can be disseminated to a, a much broader representation of that kind of audience. So they're really important in helping us package language, package tools, uh, to reach more people like them. We can't bring every single organization into a research project as a partner, so we need to find partners that kind of represent a larger group of people. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the day, ultimately, the goal here is to make sure that the research is actually taken up and is used by these partners in their operations and implementations uh, for us within water management decisions and operations 
in Canada. So I just wanted to add that kind of more specific context related to uh, Global Water Futures um, and the work that we're doing here. I think it still fits very nicely within the concepts um, and definitions and tools that uh, Katja and Jelena have uh, provided us here today. So um, that's all I wanted to add. <laughs> so we can uh, throw it over to uh, discussions. We've got people online. I can um, throw up the chat box and unmute people if there's anybody who wants to ask um, Jolena and Katja any further questions. They've got their expertise in the room. It's great to be able to utilize that. I'm going to steal this. Yep. We've got um, my cohort at Waterloo, Nancy. I know you're participating. Did you have anything that you wanted to throw into the mix as well? I've actually unmuted everybody, just so you're aware. <laughs> I know a lot of people who are participating here in the room or online, not everybody uh, probably feels like they're too involved in the actual proposal generation process. Um, I'm going to turn everybody And, you know, we're well aware of that, that, um, you know, maybe the the researchers who are writing proposals aren't necessarily the ones in the room trying to learn a little bit more about <laughs> how to do it well. Um, but I think it is so valuable and important for especially young researchers and uh, the students in the HQP that are coming up through. We want to provide opportunities for you guys to, um, you know, learn more about this and be able to utilize this knowledge and this advice once you start to uh, get into the world of proposal writing, as many of you are, um, you know, aspiring to be academics yourself. Um, and so it's just good practice to, uh, to participate in these things. So appreciate you joining, even if you feel like you don't have a lot of control in the current proposal writing opportunity that uh, Global Water Futures is going through. Well, I think, in as much as it relates to um, our some of the work we're doing with uh, metadata capture and um, uh, basically templating of uh, uh, the types of knowledge we're capturing for, which will ultimately be used for uh, making people aware of what data exists and how the data can be obtained. Um, it's, just, it's kind of fortuitous. We've been working on data templates with the other universities uh, today, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, we were just going over it and making sure that we haven't missed anything. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if you someday get a call from me um, in desperation. And I'd like you to just check this template over and uh, see if there's anything that's preventing it from being useful from a knowledge mobilization perspective. And I know that there's a lot of overlap with knowledge mobilization and our original capture of uh, metadata uh, in, our, in our work. But I'm hoping that we're doing that correctly. And this would be another sanity check on that. Well, and we talked a little bit about like within academia and knowledge mobilization as well too. So, you know, I think if you're trying to collaborate outside, uh, academia with users and partners, the principles of that can apply to working with other human beings and other context collaborations. Um, this is a big research program with lots of moving parts and lots of people, um, you know, so we can adopt some of these best practices when we're working with each other as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do hope that this uh, metadata collected will be used outside of um, 
GWF by other institutions and partners and uh, future partners. I, I'm hoping that it doesn't just in 2022, that's a wrap, um, <laughs> here to destroy that knowledge and meeting. No, that's not how it's going to work. I'm hoping that it'll continue on and the legacy of this knowledge collection will be properly uh, um, cataloged so that it can be found. If it isn't known, in a way it was never done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody online wanted to contribute any thoughts or questions? We've got lots of people. Uh, we've got our experts, myself, uh, Nancy as well, to chime in on, on how this relates to global water futures work. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, it's Nancy. So one of my thoughts, thank you so much for agreeing to help um, communicate some of these messages. I'm the knowledge mobilization specialist that Stephanie mentioned from the University of Waterloo. And so, you know, we've been trying to communicate some of these messages to people, and sometimes it helps just to talk about it in a different way. And what I like, um, I really like that you included real examples from proposals. I think that's really helpful. And what I took away from that is that um, um, often people are still still thinking that sort of the baseline of knowledge mobilization is around dissemination. And some of the newer thinking is disseminating in, in innovative ways, like thinking about new journals or new places or interdisciplinary approaches to communicating. And what you guys, what came across clearly in your presentation is that there is more beyond that when it comes to knowledge mobilization, that if you're truly trying to influence policy, you need to do more than just communicate out your ideas, probably. Um, you, you really do need to be connecting with your end users on a regular basis throughout your research program. And so I like that um, last example that you provided as well, because I think that we are starting to get to that place where you're really being able to explain um, knowledge exchange and that two-way information, um, ideas coming from your end users being incorporated into your research process and then thinking through what that means moving forward. So I don't really have a specific comment other than I like the way that you've framed this entire concept and um, one of the things I was thinking is that I need to make sure that when I'm helping people write their plans, I'm thinking through the dissemination piece plus the relationship building piece plus the knowledge exchange piece. So there's a number of elements to this. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I have a um, specific example, I guess. Um, um, we're engaging. Oh, we're going to see that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, one of the examples that I can kind of share from my own experience and research has been working with communities and indigenous communities in northern Saskatchewan in particular. And we used a knowledge mobilization plan that was integrated into the actual creation of a new research method, essentially, building off of uh, using uh, video, participatory video research and photo voice. And so what we had done and learned, uh, kind of a long story being short, but uh, was work with youth in the communities and we videotaped and, you know, asked them, you know, actually it was a co-creation uh, of knowledge between the, the youth themselves. So we had them video and ask each other questions rather than us asking questions. So it was kind of unique in that way. But what the purpose of that was, was to create a video that talked about what they like most about their community and what they like to see next. Um, and then that video was actually used uh, to showcase what the youth were talking about to elders and adults within the community. And what that video served was a way of showing that the youth were actually thinking about the same things that the adults were, and they had no idea um, they were talking or thinking about culture and the way that they were, language, restoration, things like that. Whereas they just weren't talking uh, in that way until they saw the voices of the youth 
on the videos. And it was done in a very candid way where they're talking to each other, kind of playing around. Um, and then really what shined was the fact that they um, were thinking about the same things that the adults were in the community and helped repair some of the uh, certain things were happening in the community at the time. So it was used not only as a method and approach, but it was sort of that a dissemination from the voices of the community members. So it was a really unique way of doing that. Um, and I've been involved in other projects for sure. Um, even in my own dissertation work right now, one of the things that I've done, I've collaborated uh, with uh, the Northern Intertribal Health Authority as well as health, regional telehealth coordinators. So my project is based around um, looking at telehealth in the north with perspectives on technology. And so um, the big piece there, as I heard from my knowledge users and collaborators, was you want to understand what the strengths and barriers are of telehealth in the north. And so anytime I talk to a participant or a community member, I ask them, how do you want this information provided back? And there was a range of, of things from you know coming in and making a presentation to we want a report, but not a report. But we want like a visual, like something that's almost like a pamphlet, was kind of what it came out at the end. And so I actually have a physical copy, so I don't know if you'll be able to see online, probably not, but I did bring it along because it is quite visual. It's not your typical report, it's like a little pamphlet. And of course, there's recommendations and lots of stuff at the beginning, but it's really quite a visual, has the voices, some quotes from people from the project, some of the best practices and community insights. Again, very visual, accessible, not very long. Uh, and it ended up, in terms of engaging policy, First Nations and the Inuit Health Branch reached out and said we want this in every northern community, not just the four communities to work with. So that was a piece that, and this was again um, sent to my collaborators, the knowledge users, the e-health advisors, um, telehealth coordinators who are the ones that work with those partner communities and said, you know, we agree to do something that obviously the participants were saying, which was a visual community report. Um, and then they gave feedback on it before it even went back to the community. So it was such a like intertwined co-creation of knowledge in, in a lot of ways that it was very, it was for me what it may be small little success, but it was successful in the knowledge I was, as a student, trying to accomplish as well. Those are just some other examples, I guess. So, no, that's a great example, and I think we're always looking for those tangible, mm -hmm. you know, specifics on what does the out output and outcomes look like, um, and, uh, and and how can we can only do this better if we share the successes of our colleagues and our, our peers, right? So thank you for. Is that available online anywhere that people I can I can send it? Okay, sure. Yeah. That'd be um, great. I have a few only a couple of these copies, but yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Um I had a I don't know, Nancy, if Harriet is still in the room and I can pick on her for a second, but Jared was here. Jared Wolf is the project manager of the Grey Water Project. Uh, he had to step out, but um I was just curious if from a project manager or management perspective, is there any, um, any challenges and barriers or things that you want to discuss related to the actual pulling of this content and writing together for the proposal process? Uh, any challenges? Is that what you were asking? Well, challenges, or have you come to any best practices that you know are working in? Just from that kind of logistical project management perspective. Um, I think it was said at the beginning of the webinar, um, engaging early is always a good idea. Um, making sure you're having these constant conversations with your partners um, so that when it comes time to write proposals, it's not a, um, you know, you've already been talking, having plenty of conversations, so it's not a surprise. Um, I would also, I think from my perspective, suggest, uh, sorry, we're having really funny troubles with our camera. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> And just yeah, okay. <laughs> we don't know what's wrong. We're sorry about that. Um, I think also just really important to tie the CAM plan with the different objectives and milestones that the um, faculty or the researchers are looking to achieve. I think that's really important because um, otherwise it's going to feel really disconnected. Um, so also getting the researchers to think about, you know, these are the objectives or deliverables that they, they want to produce in this project. But what does that actually mean for end users and how is that going to be done throughout the project? So I think really tying those things together is, is quite key. I think one thing we didn't 
we didn't mention, except sort of in passing, was that um, one challenge can be that, of course, um, knowledge user timelines don't necessarily match up tidally with academic timelines. And so sort of negotiating those challenges, I think, can be tricky because um, it's, again, sort of going back to that managing expectations, but also the piece of what do we do when it doesn't go as planned. Um, and I think those maybe mismatched timelines isn't quite the right way to put it because I think that's a, um, they're also on the flip side a valuable way of creating that mutual benefit and that uh, two-way knowledge sharing because um, it gives you greater insight into what the priorities of knowledge users are um, and it gives knowledge users insight into um, the realm of I guess what's possible um, and sort of thinking of creative ways to negotiate when your priorities or your timelines don't match up as tidily as they could. Um, I think it's it's often frustrating when that happens, but on the flip side, I think it also um, creates important opportunities for that dialogue and for that um, sort of building knowledge together. Anybody else online wanted to say anything that you haven't had a chance to yet? Just check the chat. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, it's Krisha actually. Hi, Stephen. We were on a meeting earlier today Hi, about Hi, Krisha. The metadata, yeah. Can I um, see you on yeah. camera? I don't know what you look like. <laughs> okay. I don't know whether I'm on or not. Uh, that's okay. I don't know whether I'm there or not. Anyway, um, but regardless, I know, um, yeah, the metadata thing within GWF is something that I, I really think could benefit from um, like the KM team's um, assistance. And I know I've been in touch with Stephanie about the data inventory and it's, um, you know, we get input about the need for the data inventory from other institutions, from various researchers. And I think that communication within our organization um, is really important because we are really trying to bring you know, all of these stakeholders in GWF together. And um, so I look forward to working um, together with Stephen and with Stephanie and and uh, in the group sort of to see if we can kind of bridge some of these gaps. So thanks very much for the presentation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to hear that the knowledge mobilization concepts can infiltrate other core teams of global modern future. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take over the world. <laughs> I do like that comment, by the way, about social media. That That is something I, again, yet for the 30th time, didn't think about. Um, that's an excellent um, use of, an appropriate use of social media. And some of these studies, uh, important ones like that, really benefit from uh, proper handling of social media. Yeah, and I, I didn't know um, many things about the knowledge mobilization before, and I just thought uh, it's the way to just uh, um, serve the results of the research to uh, people or public. Uh, it was the only thing that I knew about the uh, knowledge mobilization, but I found it really interesting, and I found that uh, it can be really helpful for the management core team to get communicate with you guys more so because you are um, we have kind of um, knowledge because the data is part of the knowledge in the research and uh, you are the people that uh, can uh, make the communication between the researchers and the public uh, with with us also and so we can uh, we can communicate with with researchers through you better and uh, I now I found that um, it's really good to have more communication with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you, should, you should put some time aside for us. We can do that. I, I have to admit I do even less than that because I asked uh, Lala what what is uh, exactly is uh, knowledge. I, I kid you not. So yeah, and I got you kind of wrong. We. It was pretty cool. It was pretty good. It was better than nothing. But I do. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, if nobody else has any uh, anything they wanted to add, we can we can always wrap it up a little bit early. And thanks so much, everybody, for coming, especially for those of you who dialed into WebEx across our sister institutions within the Global Water Futures Network. Um, we will be uh, continuing the KM Teams webinar series. Uh, we've got uh, one slated for October and November on uh, digital storytelling and uh, kind of a, a phase two of engagement with Indigenous communities because we felt like that was a really popular topic last year and there's lots to talk about so we'll just keep diving deeper into that conversation. Um, so stay tuned for the details on the dates and the WebEx call-in information uh, and then we're going to try to add some more themes. Uh, we're going to maybe try to do some joint uh, webinars between researchers and partners to try to share some of that peer-to-peer uh, engagement and, and the challenges that come with that and the successes that they've had. So uh, it won't, we're trying not to be the only people who talk about knowledge mobilization, but bring the uh, researchers and peers together to share their own experiences. So we will be releasing uh, kind of a, a more fulsome list of topics and dates uh, for the winter term soon. So stay tuned for that and uh, we will see you and hear from you next time, hopefully. Thanks everybody on the line. Yeah.